morning and welcome to Morning Movie News. First off, two things. One, as you might have already been able to tell, I'm sick. I can't believe it. It's like the only few days of the year you really don't want to be sick, and of course I'm sick. That's what I get for going for a holiday-esque walk through Central Park over the weekend when I thought I was dressed appropriately, but apparently I was not. So please forgive me uh, during today's episode and the uh, upcoming tapings for the next few days because I'm going to be a little out of sorts, but sometimes it makes me a little more punchy, so who knows, we might end up having even more fun. Now, the second thing is, is that Morning Movie News after today will be taking a break for the rest of the week because of the holiday, and it will return on Monday and Tuesday of next week. Uh, I just want to give you an idea when programming will be going up so, you know, you know when to look for it, but that also to remind you that on the main Beyond the Trailer channel, programming will be pretty much uninterrupted. There will be lots of reviews going up, all these movies are coming out, other programming and other coverage, so stay tuned there. All right, so let's get to today's stories and question. And uh, as you, if you're a regular watcher of this channel, one of my favorite things to do is to get a theme where everything uh, relates to the central uh, idea. And I get it today. It's like playing, a, it's like a puzzle, putting together a puzzle, and I'm trying to put these episodes together. So I'm so pleased when I can do this. And today's theme is creative voices, largely directors, in entertainment because I would say film usually and this is a movie news channel but movies are starting to pop up in all different kinds of places which is our first story and that's that Netflix has landed another deal another movie and that's the Judd Apatow produced Pee Wee Herman movie yes Pee Wee Herman's movie is finally happening and it's happening on Netflix this is really exciting for Netflix they've already signed Adam Sandler as you might recall for several films now they have Pee Wee Herman and Sandler by the way these days it's probably a little bit more like Pee Wee Herman than he would like. So we have that deal, and also Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon uh, 2 is also a joint deal between Netflix and IMAX, which the movie theaters were very upset about. And they actually countered by saying, well, IMAX uh, screens that are owned by IMAX can play the movie, but any IMAX screen that uh, is housed in a, a multiplex owned by a, a, you know, a theater chain like AMC or Regal, etc., will not play this movie because we don't want to encourage this kind of distribution. Harvey Weinstein was quite surprised. He thought IMAX had all their ducks in a row, uh, but of course they did not. So we'll see how that situation develops. But this movie will purely debut on Netflix. And I think that this is a little bit of a problem for the studios. Uh, we'll get into Netflix's brilliant strategy in a moment. I mean, Netflix is on fire. You know, everyone started pulling their content from Netflix because they were like, oh, hey, we want to, you know, make it available to watch online ourselves. And Netflix countered by coming up with original shows. And they have just been dominating, you know, House of Cards, Orange is the New Black, the upcoming uh, four Marvel shows, five if you count the big crossover Defenders arc, uh, and now, of course, these movies. And it's very, very exciting. But as far as the studios go, I think what's going to happen here is this is going to just further the move of the mid-range movie to the small screen. They're, I think Hollywood's just going to lose it. Uh, I think the exception, interestingly, has been Gone Girl, which is somewhat of a small film. And you could argue that maybe that could have been a long-going series on television. Maybe that would have been a very interesting place for it to pop up. But I think you can't argue that too convincingly, considering how much money Gone Girl made at the box office, not only domestically, but worldwide. So I think that was uh, a win for the studios in keeping the mid-range picture. But I think that something that made Gone Girl work, in my opinion, was the production values and, and the aesthetic, and that David Fincher made it seem very epic and large scale, even though it was a small story. But it had, was full of big ideas, but big ideas can exist anywhere, as we know from some great TV shows that we've been watching lately. But anyway, I think it's very curious to see the struggle over the mid-range movie. Now, as for Netflix's brilliance, Netflix is just so genius, in my opinion. First of all, you know, they have their own algorithms for what we like to watch, but they're clearly paying attention to that as well as they decide what deals to make going forward. So they very cleverly see, well, look, people love to watch Adam Sandler movies on our uh, platform. So why don't we make some new Adam Sandler movies? Oh, you know, people like foreign films. Let's get Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon 2 there. Uh, and then also, people enjoy watching the, you know, the old episodes of Pee Wee Herman. They like watching his uh, first movie here. Let's give them a new one. <clears throat> now also, Netflix is getting some really interesting talent on board. And that's because they can kind of take risks that the studios can't. So uh, that's very exciting because there are projects that the fans are like, oh, I wish this would come into existence. And the studios will go, well, you wish that it would come into existence, but I think it's that's too flimsy for me to, you know, bank so much, you know, so much money in people's careers and our, you know, our annual report to our shareholders. I can't take that kind of risk. 
but Netflix can. So I think going forward, you're going to see them end up with some really exciting projects like this Pee Wee Herman one that people have been asking for. Now, this is where it gets even better. Now, when a studio needs to make a movie and decides if they should make one, they have to say, well, can I convince someone to buy a ticket for this specific movie? That's the only way I can make money off of it. But Netflix has a flat rate. So they have to go, hey, will someone be willing to try this out, where the only cost to the customer is their time? And even that's not that much of a commitment, because when you watch something on Netflix, you can easily turn it off, because you're in your own environment, you're at home, you're traveling, you know, you're, you're uh, commuting maybe. It's not as big a commitment as this is my evening, I've decided to you know, plan a whole you know, time around it as you would uh, with a movie. So I think that that's something that's really exciting for Netflix and gives them a distinct advantage. Their main goal is not to convince you to spend more money, but to spend more time on their platform. And I have to say that while I would be reluctant to, as a consumer to pay money to see a Pee Wee Herman movie, you know, if I wasn't going to cover it for, for Beyond the Trailer, I would be willing to try it, especially if everyone talked about it and Netflix was able to get a lot of interest about around it. And also, movies can be very interesting for them because I feel like the one problem that they have with their binge viewing is that no one talks about their shows when they're on, really, because they drop them all at once and then there's no continued discussion. The way they're aired doesn't allow for water cooler talk. And it's hard for someone to jump on that. And also they feel, you know, you can really feel that you're so far behind because it makes such large leaps ahead each time a season debuts. But with a movie, you can catch on pretty quickly. You don't have to feel like you're behind. And also when it's released, it's a much bigger event. You know, a TV series is like, wow, I just dumped like what? Like 13 hours of programming uh, on, online? That's a really huge commitment. But instead it's like, oh, this movie comes out tonight. I mean, let me plan an evening around that. So I think this is very exciting for Netflix, and I think it's a problem for the studios. But I'm curious what you guys think. And what do you think of Pee Wee? Do you think he's smart to, to take this, uh, his, his film to Netflix? I also want to say really quickly that I'm not a big fan of Judd Apatow's monopoly over comedy. I feel it's like Lauren Michaels' monopoly over NBC's comedy. You know, it started out with Saturday Night Live, then it bled into all the TV shows they make, and now Lauren Michaels controls their late night talk shows. And I think Lauren Michaels, he misses perhaps more than he hits. You know, I'd like to say it's 50-50, but these days I don't think it is. And so it always confounds me as to why NBC gives him so much power. And I think Judd Apatow is a similar situation where, you know, you're like, well, by letting Judd Apatow be the gateway to comedy, you are potentially keeping out a lot of really great voices. That's why it's so wonderful to see Chris Rock doing what he's doing over with Top 5. But I think at least Judd Apatow should be applauded for using his power for good. He's a lot more proactive than most dictators, and he's a comedy dictator, I feel, in some regards. But, you know, he worked very hard to push female comedians with Bridesmaids and then Lena Dunham's Girls, and now it's really great to see him giving uh, Pee Wee Herman uh, another chance. It's not totally altruistic. I'm sure he feels he'll make money off of it, but I think it's, it's a commendable thing to do. All right, so the second story of the day is about Justin Lin. Now, this is a filmmaker that everybody has wanted or said they wanted, but he hasn't been able to find a new deal post uh, leaving the Fast and Furious franchises. I mean, he went right into it basically after Better Luck for Tom Better Luck Tomorrow with Fast and Furious Tokyo Drift. Um, and that movie did obviously very well. He stayed with that franchise. He directed three through six. And then he left and handed it over to James Wan. So far from the trailer, James Wan looks like he's doing a really good job. But Justin Lin, you know, I think just like James Wan wanted to leave the horror genre, Justin Lin said, hey, I want to leave Fast and Furious. I don't want to make Fast and Furious movies for the rest of my life. So he was supposed to make a new Born movie with Jeremy Renner. Then he was going to make a movie in China, which was going to be like their first really aggressive global film that was going to be shot in English and, you know, I believe Mandarin. Uh, and then he also was courted to come back to Fast and Furious when those deals weren't working out to make back-to-back -back eight and nine. So he had all these opportunities, but none of them were moving forward. It must have been very frustrating and scary for Justin Lin because he'd left such a lucrative gig. But it paid off. Uh, and we'll see if it pays off, but I think right now it's paid off for Justin Lin in the short term. And that's he's been picked to direct Star Trek III. Now this is a fascinating choice in my opinion. Why? Because Justin Lin doesn't have a relationship with the fanboy community. Not like J.J. Abrams, not like Edgar Wright, who I still to some degree think would have been a better choice. Because I guess because I, I couldn't see Edgar Wright's Star Trek, but I can't imagine what Justin Lin's Star Trek looks like. Justin Lin isn't, again, as I said, a fanboy. He is someone who's going to pull this story, I think, more into the mainstream, which is maybe what it needs, because I think the biggest problem with Star Trek Into Darkness is that it just got, you know, uh, too, too damn meta, is my, my big problem with it. And I think that 
even though it went very meta, it still didn't even please the fans, which, you know, of course, if it's going to go meta, that's who should love it. But they didn't. Uh, Star Trek Into Darkness was voted the worst Star Trek movie of all time by Star Trek fans, and that's pretty bad. J.J.'s still producing, by the way. So maybe he'll be able to make sure there's enough fanboy uh, content in there to please that core demographic. But Justin Lin makes mainstream action movies like the Fast and the Furious film. So I'm very curious to see what his Star Trek looks like. But I think he has some good qualities. I think he can streamline the story again, make sure that it doesn't reference too many other things like, uh, you know, and they say the Fast and Furious movies were, you know, of course, shot out of time. They're supposed to reference other things. I never got any of that. They were just a fun ride. And maybe that would be a nice break for Star Trek to just have it be a fun ride. I also think that Justin Lin should get a lot of credit for doing such a great job with an ensemble cast that's diverse in the Fast and Furious movies. And I think that's what he's going to be able to bring to the table in Star Trek, which has also a large, diverse cast. I think that it really became the Kirk and Spock show under J.J. Abrams. To some degree, it's always, of course, been the Kirk and Spock show, but the great thing about a TV show is that it can fl has the time to flesh out the other characters. But I don't think the movies, uh, with the exception of uh, Spock's relationship with uh, Ahura, Ahura oh, 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 I forget her name off the top of my head, Zoe Saldana, Nothing, none of the other characters are really explored, I think, to the degree that we would have liked, especially considering so many fan favorites are cast there, right? So hopefully, uh, they'll get their chance to shine with uh, Justin Lin at the helm. So I think, very exciting. Also, particularly for John Cho, because Justin Lin has such a good uh, track record with a Asian talent that hopefully uh, Sulu will finally get um, something cooler to do than that awesome uh, like samurai sword that they gave him that uh, unfolded. So anyway, that's the second story of the day. Now, the third story is actually about Jonathan Nolan. And I was not aware that Jonathan Nolan was the creative dr uh, force, you know, dri the driver, the showrunner, that's the technical term, behind HBO's upcoming uh, Westworld, which is going to be a, a very interesting show. It's based on a film that's based on a novel. And what it is basically is a theme park, like an adult theme park, which takes like the idea of Vegas to the next level. And that you can go and visit different periods in time, like the Roman, the ancient Romans, um, the, the, uh, the Wild West, <clears throat> and do anything that you want because you're interacting with robots. Robots you can have sex with, robots you can kill, uh, and you know, these scenarios play out and you know, you're you're protected from any uh, harm uh, coming to you because that's not what the park offers. Now, of course, you can kind of see where this is going, uh, and this is something that Westworld's going to explore as a series. Now, I'd heard about this. I, Ed Harris, uh, James Marston, very interesting cast, but I didn't know that Jonathan Nolan was the driving force behind it, and he's actually doing that with his wife. They're a team on this, and I think it's interesting that that's just like Christopher Nolan and his wife, Emma Thomas, are a team. And I hope that Jonathan Nolan's wife has more of an independent, creative voice, because I don't think we've seen anything from Emma Thomas. Uh, and I think that it's, uh, I was going to say ridiculous, but that's too strong a word. I think it's not good that Christopher Nolan has such a bad track record with female characters when his wife's clearly sitting right there and making these movies right next to him. I don't know why he can't just be like, well, what do you think I should do, Emma? And I don't know why she doesn't advise him. But we'll see what kind of team these two Nolans are. Now, Jonathan Nolan was supposed to kind of go out on his own with Interstellar, but unfortunately it kept dropping directors. So Christopher Nolan, uh, you know, jumped in and took over. So uh, I think that that was supposed to be something that Jonathan Nolan was supposed to be able to create his own career with, but it didn't work out. Uh, it, worked, it didn't work out in some regards, right? But I still like the film, and a lot of people did, and it's done quite well, not so much domestically, but internationally its box office is pretty good. But this is a very exciting time for Jonathan Nolan, uh, and I think it's interesting that he's establishing himself in a different medium than his brother. Will that help? But I'm curious as to what you think of the idea that when someone suddenly says Nolan in an article, as they often use the, uh, the last name to refer to a person, it's not going to be Christopher Nolan. This is what surprised me. I was scanning a Westworld, a Westworld article because this cool new picture came up, and they were like, <clears throat> Nolan says, and I was like, Christopher Nolan's involved with this? And then they were like, Jonathan Nolan, and I was like, what? So I wonder if you think it'll strengthen the Nolan brand, it'll become a, a, a brand, the brand that uh, encompasses several different creators, you know, both Christopher and Jonathan. Maybe they'll have some creative kids. Or do you think it'll weaken Christopher Nolan's brand, especially if Jonathan Nolan doesn't do a good job on Westworld and drops the ball? So I'm just curious what you think of that. Christopher Nolan has become such a big uh, persona in Hollywood and with the fan community in particular. It's like having two Spielbergs. Uh, I think that would be very weird to hear people say there are two Scorseses. You'd be like, well, which Scorsese are you talking about? It takes away the singular singularity of it. I'm just curious to what you think the ramifications of that will be. All right, I told you I was sick. 
All right, so the question comes from Santiago Ferrero. And Santiago also has a question about the voice of a creator. And San Santiago says, hi, Grace, huge fan of the show. Awesome, thank you, San Santiago. Question. I was just watching Birdman the other day, and it blew me away, especially the genius directing from Alejandro Gonzalez and Aritu. Being a Latin American myself, I was very proud, and it got me thinking, if he won the Oscar for Best Director this year for Birdman, it would be the second year in a row that a Latin American director wins that Oscar. He's talking about Alfonso Cuaron for Gravity last year. Do you think this could be a potential milestone for Latin American directors, and even other foreign ones? With the massive increase in foreign box office numbers and decline from domestic ones, could the future of Hollywood be in the hands of foreign countries? Transformers War would be nothing without China, and we wouldn't have these directorial achievements, Gravity and Birdman, without Latin American directors. Greetings from Colombia. Smiley face. Well, Santiago, I think it's wonderful that Latin American directors are doing so well here in Hollywood. And I think it's great also that they don't seem to have some of the same obstacles that other, you know, um, ethnicities, other talent is facing. Although that seems to be going away as well with the success of Ava DuVernay for Selma as a black female director. So all these walls are coming, you know, tumbling down. But as far as what you said about the success of foreign countries influencing Hollywood, I don't think we're quite there yet because the, the emphasis here should be on the fact that all this talent, despite where they originate from, is working in Hollywood. They're making movies in the Hollywood system, even if it's the independent uh, arm of Hollywood, which, you know, I think Hollywood is largely co-opted at this point. These films are all Hollywood talent, and Hollywood has a long history of foreign talent. For instance, Billy Wilder, Austrian, one of the most you know, famous directors of all time. A lot of talent comes from abroad and then comes to work in Hollywood. It's, it's nothing new. So I don't think that you can give, uh, um, sorry, Alejandro Inaritu and, um, uh, Alfonso Cuaron, you can't, even though they come from these foreign countries, the win still goes to Hollywood. I mean, it doesn't rob them of their individual win. But if you want to see ownership for success in filmmaking go to other countries, those films need to come from those countries. And I think that means those countries need to become more aggressive about tackling the uh, worldwide market. And I think that that means they have to start making their movies in English. Now, I know a number of you might bristle to that at, at first, thinking, well, why do we have to have a film from our country in another country's language? And I would say, well, this is just the universal language. Hollywood, hey, you know, Hollywood built the uh, whole movie-making system worldwide. You know, they're the foundation of it. So English is really the most accessible uh, language at this point in terms of entertainment. So if you make your movie as an English language film, it'll have a better chance of reaching the biggest markets. And right now, those biggest markets are uh, Hollywood, you know, the United States, <clears throat> those audiences, and also uh, China. Now, that's changing, but still, People in these other countries like watching films in their original English language as well. They're not going to go and learn every country's language to enjoy every country's film. They're really only going to learn, as it seems to be the case, their own native language and English. So I think, for instance, if you want a South American director from Colombia to, to succeed on the worldwide stage, they have to make a film in English and then have, that, have worldwide success. And I think that day is approaching. China is trying to do this right now. They're taking your idea, Santiago, of making their own movies that can be distributed worldwide. Toho wants to make a new Godzilla film out of Japan that is for the worldwide global audience. They're going to have to make it in English if they want that to happen. So I think it's a very interesting future for Hollywood. I don't think their I think their 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 grip on the worldwide audience is definitely loosening. And also Hollywood is changing who they make movies for. As I uh, I think that as I recently discussed with Transformers. Uh, I feel that the next Transformers will be made for China because that's where they made most of their money, most of their money. So look for more Asian actors, you know, Chinese actors, native Chinese actors to be included, more Chinese locations. I mean, that was a big money maker for them and made more money for them than any other country in the world, including the United States. So the Transformers team finally finds themselves, you know, wanting to make sure that they don't lose the American audience, but primarily making a movie for China. That's fascinating. So there's definitely a lot of change going on. But I think these countries need to get on the map if they want to wrestle any control away from Hollywood. Thank you so much for your question, San Diego. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. I apologize for my cold. I hope you still enjoyed today's episode. Write your thoughts down below. I have a very Merry Christmas. Stay tuned to be on the trailer, and I will see you back here on BTT Movie Map on Monday. All right.